Hi, Shanisa. Am I getting the name right? Hi, Kathleen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, hope you're doing well. Yeah. Um, we just want to give ourselves about two minutes for other participants to join, and then we'll just kickstart. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon once again to everyone who is on this call. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Um, thank you once again for joining. Um, this gathering is part of our ongoing research, innovation, and commercialization project. Um, this is made possible through a partnership with RISA and UK Aid. Um, so over the past few weeks, we have conducted them. Um, virtual training sessions focusing on the commercialization process. 
And we've also been having this series on this panel sessions to look at specific and selected topics related to our research, innovation, and commercialization ecosystem. And we've had adepts to share the available insights on these subjects. For the past weeks, we've had panel sessions on research, innovation, and commercialization, the opportunities and challenges involved. And we've, had, we've also had a policy dialogue on research, innovation, and commercialization, where we also looked at unlocking value from research. That was last week on Tuesday. Today, we are looking at ownership, and our moderator for today is King David. He's the corporate communications and managing uh, marketing lead at InnoHub. Um, King David, um, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Hi, King David. King David, are you here, please? I think he's having a bit of a network challenge. Um, King David, can you hear me, please? I so King David is having a, a little challenge with his internet, but he's joining in soon. And then, but whilst we wait, you can put in the chat box and um, where you are joining us from, your name and the institution that you are you are with. You can do that. You can get to know who is on this call by doing that. Um, whilst we wait for him to join in quickly. Thank you. Hello, can you, Hello hear me? can you hear me? Hi, we can hear you now. But there's a bit of um, a feedback. Is it gone now? Yes, it is. Yes, I had to quickly switch to a different device um, because we're having challenges with the first one. Um, apologies for that. All right. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And I'm excited to be here. Um, last week was a wonderful time as we spoke on commercializing research and taking away the barriers that prevent us from 
making the most of research in our various fields as industries and overall as a nation. Today, we have another interesting topic which um, forms, happens to form the cornerstone of innovation and progress. We are talking about commercializing intellectual property. We will look at how we can explore and unravel the various pathways that will help transform ideas and innovations into tangible assets to help us drive economic growth and shape industries and most likely help us to redefine our future. To help us do that, we have assembled a team of experts on our panel who would help us to really understand what intellectual property is all about, whether it's patents, trademarks, copyrights. A lot of times you hear people talking about somebody is taking my, somebody, I'm going to sue somebody for copyrights. I'm going to sue somebody for using my work of art without my permission. Sometimes it gets more like, it, it becomes more of a confusion, a source of confusion, even for me. But luckily, we have the right people to help us dissect these issues today. So we want to encourage you to stay on, invite entrepreneurs, you know, innovators, anybody who, whose work borders on um, intellectual property ownership, and how, most importantly, we can commercialize all of these to our advantage. Like I said, we have the team of experts today assembled, so I'll go ahead and introduce them. First, on our panel, um, I would like to do ladies first. Our first panel member is an associate at Gratia Law Consult, where she offers her expertise and guidance across various sectors, ranging from corporate and commercial matters to property and dispute resolution. With her multifaceted experience and understanding of legal intricacies, she is integral to delivering comprehensive and effective legal solutions. She has participated on local and international panels providing legal education to businesses in areas including intellectual property and corporate practice. She has been admitted, admitted to practice law in Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to our virtual upstage, our first panelist for today, Kathleen Boche. A round of applause for her, please. Maybe you could give us a, a, a thumbs up to show that she's, yeah, you, you are appreciating her presence. Hi, Kathleen. Good morning, Ken David. Afternoon, take, actually. <laughs> good afternoon from this end. I trust you're doing well. I'm doing well. It's nice to have all of you here. I'm looking forward to an exciting discussion with you, especially from the legal perspective on intellectual property. So that is exactly what we Thank are looking forward welcome. to. But sure, we're looking forward to benefit from your extensive experience. Sec secondly, we would want to talk about our our panelist who has recently retired as an intellectual property development executive at Aripo. He managed three departments, that is a copyright and related rights department. He also managed the legal and policy department as well as the Aripo Academy. He retired from Aripo and is in the process of establishing the African Innovation Institute in Ghana. He lectures on in intellectual property at African University in Mutari, Zimbabwe, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasa here in Ghana. He chairs the Intellectual Property Network Ghana and serves as a board member of the financial and charitable institutions here in Ghana. He obtained the World Intellectual Property Organization, that is WIPO Fellowship, to undertake six-month postgraduate studies in biotechnology and intellectual property at the Swedish Patent and Registration Office, Stockholm, in Sweden, in 2000. Whoa. Help me welcome our stage, our second panelist, Emmanuel Saki. Hi, Emmanuel. Yeah, hello. Good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon. So it looks like all your life, all your life you've lived, briefed, and eaten intellectual property. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, we, I, I, I hope I, that shouldn't have been the case, but I think I have, actually. Um, I'm very excited, I think, uh, to be part of this afternoon's um, webinar, and I do hope that we'll have very uh, informative discussions and also uh, demystify this concept of intellectual property and how it can help us to grow our businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you too, sir. We look forward to that. The last and not the least, we are inviting onto our virtual panel, our virtual upstage on this panel discussion, 
a policy analyst on governance and economics who has a bias towards promoting free market economics and removing the heavy hand of government in business here in Ghana and Africa. He has managed or is currently managing the deployment and expansion of M Pedigree's flagship Gold Keys platform and its related anti countering and supply chain visibility solutions over several countries in Sub Saharan Africa and the Indian subcontinent. He specializes in policy analysis, business development, marketing, public speech, branding and identity, project management, web design, interface design, intranet design, data management, and IT consulting. A round of applause and a thumbs up for Selom Brantier. Hi, Selom. Hi. Hi, sorry, I was on mute. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, I am looking forward to um, a very wonderful discussion from you all. And uh, I'm glad to be here and part of this uh, really, really um, uh, packed, uh, inter intellectually packed panel. <laughs> mm. That was great. We're certainly looking forward to that. And maybe one thing that I, I forgot to mention in his profile, I'm sure a lot of us have heard about Imani. Um, he happens to be the Vice President for Strategy and Communication at the Imani Center for Policy and Education. So you can see that we have quite a packed panel. We're going to have a, a perspective from the legal angle. We're also going to have it from the policy and then practice angle. And then we have somebody who has probably done IP all his life. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for joining us and for our participants who have joined us from across Ghana and anywhere else in this world, we say thank you for joining us. You can quickly put in where you're joining us from in the chat section. And also, if you have any questions as we discuss, please do well to either drop it in a chat section where we'll pick it up during the Q&A, or you can kindly write it down. We don't want you to miss your question. Write it down. When it's time for Q&A, we will call you for you to ask your question. So thank you very much for joining us. And as I mentioned in my introduction, IP, intellectual property, happens to form the cornerstone for innovation and entrepreneurship and all things around in that. And today we are talking about how do we commercialize intellectual property? We're going to talk, talk about what IP in the first place is, what are some of the challenges sometimes you might face when you want to look at IP, and most importantly, how do we commercialize it? How do we pick our ideas and thoughts and then commercialize it? And probably somebody might also ask, is it every idea that I can put an IP on as a patent or a copyright? That is why we have our panel today. So we want to just kick off by getting into our discussion for today. My name is Ken David and I'm happy to moderate this session. Our first question, I think based on the nature of our question, we want to pick it from Emmanuel your thoughts first, and then our mem other members would follow. When we talk about intellectual property, what really is it? And probably you could help us with some examples of what intellectual property bothers on so that our everybody gathered here today would be on the same page as we progress on this conversation. So hi, Manuel, what would you really say um, intellectual property is? And what are some examples you could state to emphasize that? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, King. Um, good afternoon once again. I hope I am very audible. Yes, sir. Good. I think uh, when we talk about intellectual property, uh, we are basically referring to uh, the creations of the mind. And when I mention the creations of the mind, I'm just referring to the ideas, the information, and the knowledge that we possess that enable us to uh, churn out new solutions or solve problems that is facing humankind. And this intellectual property uh, 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 notion is basically about our thinking and the way we look at challenges as we come across them on a daily basis. Uh, there was this woman that, uh, you know, Pisa, um, the pizza always has a topping. And um, when, when they cover it with a pizza uh, box or packaging, the packaging, the one on top saps. So, you know, once it saps, 
it sits on the toppings of the pizza. And then uh, when you open the pizza uh, package, then the toppings gets lifted off the pizza. And so this was a, a challenge that, you know, was facing some uh, pizza distributors and all that in America. And then the woman just created a very simple angel tripod, something like a tripod, which sits at the center of that, um, uh, what do you call it, the pizza, just to hold the toppings. Now, if we are applying intellectual property, then we are saying that there was a problem. And the problem was that the packaging on the uh, pizza uh, package was sapping and therefore was affecting the consumption of the pizza. The appearance was not very good. And this person brought a new solution to resolve that by creating this tripod. I'm trying, trying to make it very simple. We hmm. have the paper clip. We all know the paper clip. It many, many years ago, it was uh, 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 protected as an invention. It's just a, a simple device that enables us to hold things together. And that was it. It created so much uh, benefits to humankind that today we are still using paper clips. So this intellectual property is basically the things that we, 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 we use our minds and our brains for, either by way of new knowledge we have acquired, a desire to solve problems, investigation, either through research and development, typing ideas from customers, imagination, exposure, and then our inspiration. And of course, to some extent, the curiosity that we all have. But the beauty of it is that this intellectual property, uh, as we call it, we, we, when we chain them out, we describe them as intellectual assets when we change them out. And this intellectual assets is where now we start having the challenges because they become valuable objects. And for us to be able to then leverage on them, we need to find mechanisms to be able to protect them and so commercialize them, or if you like, put them through the machinery of creation of wealth. And this is the whole subject of the intellectual property. So we are creating a property which is a commercial, which is for commercial transaction. And that commercial transaction enable us to then create wealth. But unfortunately, many of us, we have created these assets. We have not even bothered to protect them. We have not bothered to ring fence around them. And so we have just created them. And, and they don't assume the commercial value, which will now become tradable. And I think that is why the subject of intellectual property has now become so much an issue, particularly in this part of the world. So this is the basic form of intellectual property. And if you remember, uh, I gave you two examples. One, the pizza, mm -hmm. the paper clip, very simple, but it can also be very, very complicated. You remember the COVID-19 and the the fact that we were able to develop vaccine, it came mm -hmm. from something called CRISPR. And CRISPR is basically gene editing, the capacity to edit the genes of a human being. And it was created by two women, one American, one a French person. And they even got Nobel Prizes for that. Little did they know that in 2020, we were going to have COVID. So if you look mm. at biotech and then a Pfizer, they utilize this uh, new technology of gene editing to then develop vaccine, which ordinarily, if we had gone through the traditional route of vaccine development, would have taken not less than five years or 10 years as the case may be. But because of this new sophisticated technology, we were able to do that. And so uh, this IP, which is rooted in various forms, which if uh, you come again, I would explain, are uh, the things that we are uh, uh, chilling out to solve our daily problems and manage the challenges facing humanity. Mm, mm. Well, that's quite a lot to have unpacked in just your opening comment on what IP is. And I think the examples on paperclip and pizza have brought home so much that point. And so quick question before I move on, this, this is a quick follow-up. So 
would I, would you want to say, and that's because you, you made an important point that we have not bothered to ring fence the various innovations which might have come up in our, 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 our various works we do. And I want to quickly ask, this is just my ignorant self asking. So one of the most innovative forms of creating cloth here in our part of the world is the weaving of the kinti. Yeah. Uh, that process, is it something that can, you can put an IP on or could we have put an IP on when it came up? Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I did mention that if this issue come up, I'll probably explain. Uh, you know, okay. the intellectual property uh, system uh, mm. has a number of tools or what mm. they refer to as IP regimes. Mm. Uh, and this is now legal. Uh, these are legal rights and they come in various forms and I'll quickly explain them. Uh, just for us to be, have a very uh, useful conversation. Uh, okay. You know the word inventions and innovation. Okay. These are functional things, things that they, they, they are used to, for functional things. For example, a pen is used for writing. And then if you have a, 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 a cell phone, you use it to hear something. So we call them functional things. They are mm -hmm. subject of patents. So patents deal with functional attributes of any artifact. And then within that bracket of patents, we have some people who just modify things that are in existence. For example, the can of Coca-Cola, that a uh, uh, metal can that um, we put the Coca-Cola in with a, with a cup with a, that you were able to lift uh, it at the top and then drink. Somebody just de designed that small portion of the lifting up and then just uh, uh, transferred it or licensed it to Coca-Cola. And he's getting mm. his money for it. But we call those things modifications of existing artifacts. They come under what we refer to as utility models. They are as it were petty patterns. Then you know when you have something that has to do with uh, ornamental, uh, you know, appearance, you know, shapes and things like that. They all come under industrial designs. Then we have trademarks, what we normally uh, 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 refer to as signifier of products or differentiation of products. You want to differentiate your product from another person. Then of course you have to get the rights, which is now legal and it is not a business name. I am referring to legal rights, which come through, uh, it comes through trademarks. Then you have the things like um, integrated circuits for semiconductors. Mm. We don't do that, those things that much. We have copyrights, various forms of copyrights. And then we can talk about them as well. We know them. These are expressions of human ideas, expressions, expressing them in material forms. We call them copyrights. Then you have breeders' rights, those who are involved in plant varieties and what have you, changing a different genetic composition of plants. So there are all this range of pieces of intellectual property regimes, and they are addressing all the fields of technology. So name it, anything that you want to do, you should be able mm, to find mm, mm, an mm. IP right that fits that thing. And I am more, I'm not a, a hands-on person. I am more of a creative and a writer. So I fit more into the copyright space. I write books. I write, you know, uh, some, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, uh, policy documents and things like that. So mm -hmm. all human beings, we have been given ability and every single ability of ours is able to do all these things. And of course, when you mm -hmm. mention the Kente, then it brings me to another dimension. And I kept it for last, what we refer to as geographical indication or indications. Mm. They are basically origin-based products. Products that have certain qualities associated with certain places. I've been to Bore, I've been to Adaumase, I've been to uh, Kleko. I've seen all the Kente because I, I teach intellectual. Uh, traditional knowledge as well. So I know all these things. And, and what it is is that various forms of it, new forms, the existing form, we can still use an IP regime called geographical indication because it is an indication that relates to a tradition which is based on in a certain a, a place, geographical origin. So all these mm -hmm. are things that we are able to do. And I know WIPO, which is an international organization, is working with the Registrar General's Department, the Ghana in Industrial Property Office, to then uh, use uh, geographical indications to protect the uh, Ghanaian folkloric works, i.e. Uh, the Kente, the 
the burger basket, the uh, the bees making in Agomenya, the various kintis even from the water region, and all those cosmetic issues from north, the shea butter, all of them, we have categorized them and I have been involved mm, in some mm, of these mm, things. So these are issues that mm. we can use this intellectual property or these are commodities that we can use in various forms of intellectual property to deal with them. And for us to be able mm. to deal with them, we have something we call intellectual property asset management. And that is what mm. we utilize then to be able to harness all these uh, innovative outputs and determine which IP rights to use at mm. what time to be able to protect them for us to be able to commercialize right. them. Right, 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 right. Wow. <laughs> this is a lot. I, I feel our time is already too little for this an hour to discuss this, but I'll come back to you. Thank you. Um, yes, sure. So I'll come to you. Hi, Kathleen. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. I can hear you. Yeah, yeah great. So I am sure um, I can see that Ni has his hand up. Ni, I would come to you. We would come to you during the question and answer session. You can kindly put your question in the chat section, or we can put it down so that when it gets to Q and A, we'll call you to make your comment or your question. Thank you very much. So, we, we, from where we have had the stage set by Emmanuel, you are a lawyer by practice, and you've you've worked in various instances which has great borders on intellectual property. I think it's quite evident that there are benefits, but do you think, what, what really tangible benefits do you think there are um, based on your experience to having an IP protect our ideas? I think Imano talked about how moving from ideas to become assets. From your perspective, um, legal, business, academic, what benefits are, are there? And since there are benefits, what is it that is preventing people from taking advantage of these benefits when it comes to IP? Okay, so thank you, David. Um, so I'll say in my experience, most of the benefits from IP or intellectual property comes from registration, right? Mm -hmm. You have economic benefits and then moral benefits. Um, so as Mr. Saki has explained, intellectual property is the protection of your creation that is from your mind. So um, I, I just want to give a big, a brief background to be able to explain what the sure. benefits and some of the challenges are. So I'll say that if you pay attention, you realize that intellectual property is all around us. It's probably mm. on the bag that you carry this morning, the bottle of water that you drink, and even the clothes that you're wearing now. So simply put, it's, it's something that's unique to your mind and it's from your intellect. And because it's from your intellect, it's your property. And that's why from the legal perspective, we say intellectual property. So the aim of the law mm. is to enable other people to acknowledge your creation, the creation from your intellect, and is to protect your creators, the creator's rights, um, the creator's work through rights in order to encourage the creator to keep on creating. Mm. Um, so he... Um, Sasaki spoke about copyrights, patents, industrial designs, and trademarks, and we have legislations that cover each of these. Um, but it's important to register um, each work, whether it's a copyright, a trademark, or an industrial design, um, mm. so that you can read the benefits that um, are associated with them. So you, with registration of um, your work, it's generally based on a first to file or first to invent, depending on the kind of trademark or um, patent or industrial design. Um, and it's vital to obtain protection through registration before you introduce your products or services to the Ghanaian market, because um, it's likely that these works could be passed off in law, we call it passing off. And passing mm. off means where you, for, for instance, let's talk about in the realms of trademark. So let's say you come up with a logo or a brand identity for your work. So let's say a popular brand like, um, I don't know if you're in the fashion space, if you know of Christy Brown or mm -hmm. internationally, you know, Gucci or something, right? You will okay. see yeah. our markets, our local markets that they'll be selling mm -hmm. things like Gucci or um, Christian Brown or some, something like that, right? That is an mm -hmm. imitation of the creator's work 
but it's mm. passing off as the creator's work, though it's an imitation of that work. And they are dangerous with this because um, it could be a misrepresentation of the creator's goodwill. So I might go into the market think that I'm buying something from Christy Brown. That's the first example that comes to mind. Meanwhile, I'm buying it from a different person. And then it turns out that maybe there's a seam on the dress that's ripped. I'll be thinking that, what kind of shoddy work is this? Meanwhile, that work is not from the original creator, which is Christy Brown. So those are some of the challenges. Another challenge is if you don't register your work, other people are reaping the benefits, like monetary benefits from your work. Um, because when you register your work, you have, you, if you register the work at Registrar General, for instance, you have, you've created rights over that work or economic rights over that work and moral rights over the work. So that if anybody tries to reap some monetary benefits from the work that you have created, you can sue them. You have the right to sue them because then you can wave your, your certificate in your face and say, hey, I've registered this work. You have to acknowledge me and you have to seek my consent to be able to use this work. So that's like the benefits. The major benefits I'll say from the legal perspective is to register your work so mm. that you can avoid mm. certain challenges like passing off. You can avoid certain ch challenges like misrepresentation. It could even go into the realms of fraudulent misrepresentation. People may use your name for fraud to perpetrate fraud. Um, and it's, it's just, it's just it, not to muddy the waters, but these are some of the things that could come up. So it's very, very important to register your work so you can claim economic rights and moral rights. Hmm. It's important to register your work so that you can claim the economic benefits as well as moral benefits. But I would want to move to Salon, but just before that, I have a, a thought that crossed my mind where you were talking about to avoid these limitations and avoiding misrepresentation. So I am, there's one brand, like when you mentioned um, Gucci and how he, the imitations that have come, one thing that easily crossed my mind was Adidas. You see Abibas. If I'm an Ab Adidas, can I sue somebody for bringing out Abibas, which is so close to mine and people could pass off as my work? Can I sue? Hi, so Caitlin, are you there? Yes. Yes. Um, yes, so you can sue. And it's, it's easier if you have registered the work, right? Because mm. when you're suing to your, you, you have to, there's an element of proof. So you have to prove mm. that you have rights over those work, over the work that you've created, and you want to enforce those rights. That is why you are suing. You're enforcing some rights that have been recognized by the law because you cannot use the law as ammunition or a shield if what you've created is not recognized by the law, right? So like I said, it's like a first to file or first to search. When you go and register at the Registrar General, if it's a trademark, for instance, you conduct a search. When you conduct a search, then you fill a form and then you give copy uh, copies of your trademark. And then they, they see whether um, there's an existing trademark that is identical to what you're trying to file or um, they have a, a checklist of whether it's, it's, um, it's uh, morally right. So like you're, mm. you're not saying anything that's like offensive morally <laughs> to the public. Okay. Um, yes. Um, so they look at all that criteria and then if you pass that, you pay the required fee and then it's registered. And then if somebody um, uses your work without your consent for some sort of economic benefits, it doesn't even have to be from a, for an economic benefit. They are using your work without your consent. Like I said to you earlier that the law aims to protect your creation in order to encourage you to create. So if somebody is using Abidas or Adidas or, or, or whatever, the law recognizes that someone sat down, created some work from their intellect, and that inter that that work is their property, and they've gone ahead to register and pay to protect that yeah. right. So if somebody is using that um, your your work without your consent, you can go to the courts. Obviously, you can come to disputes lawyers like us, <laughs> and then we can sue on your behalf. Interesting. I think I have a few people in mind I'll be suing very soon, but I'll come and register first so that I can go back and see you. <laughs> yes. Anyway, thanks thanks for that education. Salom, I'll come to you next. Um, you have quite an extensive experience when it comes to on the field work, which would require 
you probably through your processes to have gone through some form of IP or the other. You've worked in business development, web design, interface design, data. I think you definitely have come into contact with one IP one way or the other. From these experiences, could you share um, some of the observations in Ghana to illustrate how some of these intellectual property principles work yeah. and how it yeah. applies to your work? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, thanks so much. It's 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 been a very great discussion so far. I mean, with the whole background and then the legal context being um, discussed as it is, and actually it sets the tone for what we will think about when we talk about the 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 need to commercialize some of these things. And uh, so I'm speaking from the point of somebody who probably is a is a foot soldier, if if, if that word can be used. Um, exactly. <laughs> because um, I, I, a lot of these things really sound um, highfalutin or they sound um, alien until you are actually you actually have to to encounter the challenges that uh, come with not um, being able to have registered your IP or, or some of the things that could happen. Um, so, I mean, I have had lots of uh, personal uh, instances, I mean, encountered it during the course of my business that has uh, determined uh, why some of these things are important. Um, so actually, my company um, deals with this situation in two very interesting ways. Um, M Pedigree is a company that um, helps to prevent uh, counterfeiting, and we developed a solution that uh, was supposed to, or is uh, helps uh, people determine whether they are buying fake or original products. So in a way, we are helping people with some aspect of their IP in different industries, um, mostly related to agricultural, pharmaceutical, manufacturing, um, save their IP from people who would want to exploit it or use it for uh, um, other purposes uh, that uh, either dilute the brand value of the original uh, 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 innovator or creator of the product, or um, uh, those who uh, uh, want to misrepresent a brand for different reasons. But in the course of whilst we we're building the product, we ourselves also had to actually um, um, uh, patent our our product, and um, it took us about three to four years because we we used uh, we had to use. Uh, 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 we had to register our patents in the in the US as well as in in Europe, and so we had to hire international lawyers and all of that, uh, because most of our clients or those we dealt with were also uh, situated uh, on these continents, which meant that we had to have it at that international level, uh, which is not a joke for most of mm. uh, most most innovators uh, on the African continent, um, uh, because uh, that's area of IP is one where uh, I would say you would have to have like huge, so to speak, huge balls to be able to stand your ground. Mm. Uh, and for an African uh, company, it's even harder. Uh, statistics, if you look at statistics recently, and some of you can do that if you're part of the audience, you would realize mm. that in Ghana, for example, the total number of patents uh, that have been registered in Ghana over the past five years will not be more than about one one fifty. Wow. Yes. Uh, I've forgotten the actual figure. I once posted on Facebook about it. And it shows that that aspect of what we do has been seriously neglected. And um, it, it is a cause for worry because um, some of us in the innovation space have been victims. And I'll give you an example. Um, this same solution, just before we had uh, uh, completed some of our patenting activity, we were asked by one of the uh, biggest companies, electronics companies in the world, to explain our solution so that they could deploy it in Africa. I wouldn't mention the company's name. Hmm. Hmm. Hello? Hi, Salom, are you there? They asked us for certain progress, uh, what do you call it, process flow diagrams and things. So, so, and when sorry, we, Salomon, we, left you, we lost you for a moment. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm saying that uh, whilst we were whilst we we're discussing um, how to uh, market our solution to. Mm -hmm. We were asked to demonstrate how the system works, a uh, process flow mm -hmm. and all of that. And then when we did that, they didn't get back to us again. About three months later, we saw that they had varied our solution and then we were presenting it as an innovation. Now, guess what? Mm -hmm. This company has a pool of over 100 IP specialists and they make, they, they alone present about, let's say, almost about... 500 to 1,000 patents a year. So, wow. yes. So if you are a, a small African startup, how can you even take them to court in the first place? And how, how much are you going to spend just on litigation whilst doing that? So I believe that one of the things that needs to happen um, is that we, we need to have a culture or a space where, especially in Ghana, uh, and in sub-Saharan Africa, our young innovators are spared some of the disappointments that some of us have gone through. And that will only be done if um, we have uh, some kind of um, IP accelerator or IP registration accelerators uh, in the space to be able to help and guide because it is not a very simple and easy process. Um, Sometimes, even when you are a startup in Ghana, you want to move to another country. One of the ways in which other people frustrate you is that once you present your proposals, then some of the people who are the audience, or let's say if you are dealing with a government agency, for example, and it happened to me, mm -hmm. it happened to us in Tanzania, where we went and then proposed a solution and everything. And just before we got signed, we got slapped with a, a what do you call it, a, a lawsuit that we were in uh, some company has already in uh, what some company has registered that patent and we were rather uh, uh what do you call it uh, infringing the on their how, yeah but then it was laughable and it was silly because we, we have had extensive proof of it about six seven years before and then i mean we buried them in court but that just shows you that uh ip in itself is not something that you register just for pride it has huge mm. commercial consequences. And why do I say there are huge commercial consequences? It is because um, in, 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 in uh, coming up with an innovation and then thinking this through, you might, the, the IP itself might not be the main product that will come out, but it will be a component of another huge product. Where, for example, so I think um, it was uh, uh, Mr. Is it Mr. Saki, right? Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Saki, that, uh, uh, I, uh, what do you call it? Um, alluded to the Coca-Cola, uh, can, the canned Coke, uh, mm. what do you call it? Opener. The opener part, yes. yeah. That canned Coke opener earns somebody 0 .00000001, uh, dollars per can. Mm. And if you look at the mm. millions of cans that are sold, um, mm. uh, even daily, it means that somebody somewhere, just because of this innovation, is reaping millions and billions every year because if you have about uh, 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 two billion cans being sold a day that alone is about hundred thousand dollars so wow. it just goes on and on and on and there are lots of scenarios where these become very important because they are assets that can be traded they are assets mm. that can be bought and sold in fact ip is actually a product on itself so if your company owns ip it then becomes a very important negotiation factor or a very important negotiation chip. When, let's say, you want uh, to get investors or you want to get some equity. Let me give you a very recent, uber recent scenario of where that plays. So mm. I'm sure some of us have all heard about the boardroom brohaha that just happened over the weekend with a company called OpenAI. Um, yeah, yeah. Which is a research company. Uh, and OpenAI was re uh, has or uh, is researching into artificial intelligence. Now they they are they split into two parts: the NGO uh, and then the uh, commercial part. But the NGO part is the one that does the chat GPT, which is every student's best friend now. And um, <laughs> yes, and uh, 
currently it is uh, the commercial part is 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 well twenty dollars a month, and they have over hundred million subscribers already. Now that means that at twenty dollars a month for hundred million subscribers, that alone is two billion dollars, give or take. I think if my math is right. Now you have this very valuable company with very valuable people that has sacked its board chairman, that sacked the CEO, etc. And Microsoft has jumped in and hired all those guys. The value of those guys and the intellectual uh, property that they would bring into Microsoft means that immediately Microsoft's value is probably going to hit over a trillion dollars more if they're able mm. to get all these people to get in. And it is the foundation of a lot of things. Um, there, there has been uh, a lot of situations where one small company's IP alone can determine whether they get a uh, hundred million dollars more every year or not. So basically, mm. it means that we here must also learn to guard very uh, viciously the things that we create. And it, it, at first, it wasn't a big deal because um, there was very little in terms of legislation. There was very little in terms of um, our ability to protect these things. But I'll give you one final scenario from a friend of mine that will yes, 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 let you that understand, one. and that is local. So mm. um, I have this friend who was one of the, uh, who originated the idea where you could borrow uh, credits when your calls were finished, when, when your call, your airtime was finished. And he presented mm. this idea to Tigo. Um, that was back in 2010 or 2011. And we were all bullish about it that, I mean, this was his break in life, et cetera. And Tigo, what happened for him was that when he documented this idea, he documented all his communications with Tigo. And mm. they said they were not interested. Then a few months later, they came in with the Tigo, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they were the first to introduce, uh, what do you call it? Uh, borrowing credits in Ghana. So this friend of mine uh, saw that this is a direct ripoff of his idea. And he had evidence that he had talked to Tigo and Tigo said this was novel and this was the first time in the market and all of that. So he took it to court. It took him seven years, but he's won a $17 million settlement. Wow. Yes, and this is right here in Ghana. He won that settlement. I guess this is not far away from, from us then. Exactly. Okay, so the law works. Mm, you see? Mm, mm, mm. And I think... See, I think... Tell them the law works. Yeah, the it law works. It's long yeah, and tedious, all... but it works. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it works. But it's, it's, it's been a very recent um, scenario. And it took mm. people like this to begin to actually get the some of these case laws established if you if, if if so to speak so suddenly after that a few people have now picked up on that and are now being very very um uh, careful of these ideas and it all mm. starts with how you document your initial idea how you mm -hmm. register it how you get it published so like um, kathleen was saying it is really 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 important to document these ideas in a way in which a legal person and somebody who has done uh, IP before can do it. Whilst it might sound expensive to do, it is something that I strongly encourage because while, however much you spend to, to market the idea, if you do not protect it when it is yours, you are going to lose. Look at this friend of mine. He's now $17 million mm. richer because of an mm. idea that he had the the, the the what you call the presence of mind to document and such that even when he was pitching the idea and he had not even registered it he had proof and he was able to mm. derive from the type of communication that he made with the people he prospected mm. to mm. so beyond mm. just um, 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 um registering the idea and all of those things it is important that you have anytime you are going to discuss a new innovation that you have done that is different from everybody else it's important to have uh, not just a non-disclosure clause, but a non-compete clause, as well as mm. uh, certain other legal, uh, what do you call it, barriers that prevents people who are potential clients from bullying you just because you are, uh, in right. quotes, a small boy or a small girl. 
So great, from my expect, great, great. Uh, perspective on the field, this is what I have seen and mm. have found out. Interestingly, I had about five questions lined up, but it looks like our panel had a preview to my questions, probably through ChatGPT. And from their, their, their own experiences they just shared, it looks like they have answered almost every part of the questions that we had to talk about. And it's great at how you ended it on your point, um, Selom, how you talked about the fact that it's not just about going to register um, your IP, like we said, Google register, your patent, the ID and all of that, but always take a step to first document it and be viciously protected by always documenting whatever conversations she is going to be an NDA. And luckily we have a lawyer on the call who has committed to the fact that if you're looking for how you want to protect your ideas and all of that, she would be the one of the best people you want to speak to. And we are happy to have you um, mention that on, on the call, Caitlin. We want to just take a few more thoughts on this. And I wish there could be a part two of this conversation because there's a whole lot of follow-up questions that are coming up. And we have some questions in the chat we'll come to shortly. But quickly, I want to come to you, Caitlin. In just a few words, in Emmanuel's introduction, he talked about the, the various types of IP that there are. I know there is a tall list of things that we could discuss, but from your experience in what you've been dealing with so far, um, what are the various types that um, you, you mostly encounter in, and other people are trying to commercialize? Just a few of them that you normally come across and just some quick exploration, explanation, maybe in two minutes. We'll be happy for you to do that for us. Yes, okay, so um, just to add to Salom's point that um, before I, I tackle this question that it's actually a criminal offense <laughs> to use um, um, registered rights um, without the owner's consent. There are um, fine penalties and imprisonment penalties. So mm -hmm. just wanted to add to that. But um, to come to your question, King David, um, the most popular type of IP is I, I come across as trademarks. Um, mm. because everyone seems to have a business these days um, even mm. if it's social media businesses Instagram businesses um, but trademarks are I, I want to break it down um, so Please do. When, when you create a design that's unique to you you want to be recognized for it so you create a brand identity so this could be through your name a mark a symbol a logo to first identify the source of your work and then seconds to distinguish your products from another company or individual's product. So think about that as marking your trade. Mm. That's why we call them in law trademarks. So, mm. you know, um, you can, it could even be a slogan. So like MTN, everywhere you go, um, mm. probably when you see um, a yellow, um, uh, a yellow call operator, you probably immediately think of MTN. Um, mm -hmm. It could be numbers. I don't know if anybody has seen 8020 burgers, but it could be that. Mm -hmm. um, it could be names of people. So I could even just come up with a business and, and call it Kathleen Butchery. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so the, those are for train marks. With copyrights, I'll say think of copyrights as the right to copy. So a copyright owner is anyone who develops an original piece of work and gives others the rights to copy the work by showcasing it, reproducing it, distributing it, or renting it out. So in Ghana, textbooks, storybooks, film scripts, articles, paintings, music, and all of that um, are examples of copyrights. Mm. Um, so typically, when creators think about intellectual property, it's trademarks and copyrights that immediately come to mind. But that could be probably because patents are technical, but you can define a patent as a right granted to an inventor to prevent his or him his his or her invention from unauthorized use for a period of time. But to qualify mm. for a patent, the invented pro product or process must be new, innovative, and capable of using industry. So a patent is simply a title granted to protect an invention over a product or a process. And then mm. lastly, I'll speak about industrial designs. So an industrial mm. design is the composition of lines, colors, three-dimensional forms, or any material or textile design, which gives a special appearance to a product or industry and serves as a pattern for a product of industry. And to qualify, similarly as a patent, to qualify for industrial design, your design must be new, 
it must be original and it must be significantly different from known designs. Um, mm. And all of these, you can find them in legislation, speaking from the law. Um, we have the Patents Act, we have the Trademarks Act, we have Industrial Design Act and Copyright Act. That's all briefly say about intellectual property. Good one, good one. I just have a quick follow-up question. I've seen Wini Kutin has put up a question. We will pick it up shortly. Please don't go. Ni, we will put up a question. We've acknowledged it. We also have, um, yeah, two, two very good questions from Ni and one from Wini. Please keep on putting your questions there. We'll pick them up shortly. So quick follow-up question. Recently, a lot of people were talking about how a certain country had been make, remaking the designs of top cloth um, makers or fabric makers here, manufacturers in Ghana, like GTP fabric and all of that. If somebody copies the design and goes to reproduce in another country, would that be a violation of industrial designs? Um. With industrial design, I think uh, Mr. Saki will be best placed to um, answer this, but I know that um, sometimes um, your registrations are restricted to the country of registration, unless mm. maybe you register it through like um, the Madrid system or the WIPO system or the ARIPO system. Mm. I don't know what specifically it is for industrial designs, but sometimes when you register in um, uh, through these systems, you have um, coverage, your right is covered in other um countries that are listed under these systems. But typically, mm -hmm. if you register, let's say in Ghana, it's covered in Ghana, but I don't know specifically from social design, maybe Saki can help me on that. Okay, Saki, I was actually coming to you next. So please pick that up and let me ask you a follow-up one quite quickly. Oh yeah, thank you very much. I, I was just going to add that um, uh, two quick issues. The, the first one has to do with this industrial designs. Um, mm. We have the Hague system, which allows us to do international registration of designs. And then we also have the regional system, which is uh, in Africa, the Aripo system. Of course, we shouldn't forget the OAP, the French uh, uh, you know, uh, institution, which is based in Yaoundé. So mm. yes, if you have registered a design, which is um, protected, then obviously you will be infringing on the, uh, the, the right folder. I must also add that maybe this conversation has not come up. Uh, IP is uh, uh, territorial, the protection is territorial. In other words, if I register my IP in Ghana, uh, I, it is not registered in Togo. People can use the IP in Togo because it's free for them because it's not protected. Oh. Yeah, the only, the only problem is that if you try to develop any product from that and then you are bringing it to Ghana, then obviously it's protected in Ghana, so to be a, 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 an infringement. And that is why we normally teach uh, what we call IP strategies so that you, you always get to know who are your competitors and then you try to protect uh, your IP against your competitors. So that is a different topic that we'll be discussing maybe later on. Uh, and then again, I also want to highlight the fact that I think uh, Selom uh, raised an issue about statistics. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to just advise, uh, inform you that uh, the reason why sometimes you have low numbers in Ghana and some of these other countries is that they, they are using the regional system. So for example, mm -hmm. Ghana is party to the Harare Protocol. So all patents that are designating Ghana, applicants prefer to file them through Aribo. So mm. usually Ghana will have about 500 to 600 patents registered. Uh, mm -hmm. Almost 90% of them will be coming from a repo. So if you go to the IP office in Ghana, maybe you'll find 20 registrations, maximum 25 or something, which may not be very impressive. But of course, the majority of them are protected in a repo. How, how, however, almost 95% of them are foreign in any case. So whether it's even uh, uh, that much. I think the point Selam was raising is that locals, we are not really utilizing the IP system that much. And I think uh, these are things that we just really have to think about uh, as a, a young uh, in entrepreneurs. We just need to know that intellectual property is not just bundles of rights that we use them for, uh, uh, you know, to sue people and things like that. But these mm -hmm. are really things that are promoting our businesses. They help us to facilitate, you know, guarantee quality and safety of our products. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. just need to be deliberate about them all the time mm -hmm. and encourage one another that 
if there is a problem, just as Salam highlighted, we have a pool of legal experts in Ghana. Uh, we, we, when I was at Aripo, we established a master's in intellectual property program in Dar es Salaam, Africa University, and then Kwame Nkrumah University. And so we have churned out over 450 master's students. And so currently, those of you who are interested, we still have the master's in intellectual property program at the Kwame Nkrumah University. If you're interested, you can enroll there and then also get more mm. information on IP. We're trying to uh, mm. scale it down to certificate level, level, diploma level, so that young businesses and people who are in, uh, entrepreneurs can really go and study for IP for about three months, six months, get the basics, and then come back to, you know, use them for their work. Mm. Mm. Interesting. And it's good you mentioned these new things that I have. Because my next question to you was going to be about new developments occurring in the field of intellectual property, and it would be good for us to contextualize it to Ghana. So beyond how we are trying to ensure that there is this master's program, what other new things are happening in the field of intellectual property that you might want to be aware of in just about um, a minute or two? Um, oh, yes. yeah. yeah, I think, I think uh, it's also very interesting. Uh, you know, uh, Kathleen mentioned the registrar generals. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been involved in some of these processes. Uh, they are trying mm -hmm. to hive off the the IP from the Registrar General's department. Of course, mm -hmm. now even the element of companies is gone. And so uh, the Registrar General's, which is headed by Mrs. Grace Sahak, is basically managing IP and then I think uh, marriages and estates. So mm -hmm. we are also planning to hive off the IP. And it is very good for Ghana. It's a very good mm -hmm. thing. You know, there's a a bill in parliament currently to establish uh, the Ghana Industrial Property Office uh, mm. as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an independent uh, or semi-autonomous body, then they mm. will be able to facilitate the processes of IP registration uh, uh, in the country. Of course, there's also mm. the Copyright Administration, which is, is there. So all of these agencies are helping. I must also add that we have also established the IP network, which is helping uh, it's a pool of IP experts who we have come who have come together to assist in uh, anything to do with IP. And then above all that, I just finished the, the World Bank project. You know, there's a project which is go currently going on called Jobs and Skills Projects in Ghana. We were hired to do intellectual property and technology transfer. So we have developed about 32 model agreements, 15 of them for research collaborative agreements, and then 16 of them for technology transfer agreements. Mm. All these things are very necessary to be able to enable domestic transfer of technologies because technology transfers are very, very critical for uh, uh, what is called a business uh, a growth and business diversification. So if we as a nation are not utilizing technology transfer, both domestic mm. and foreign direct investment, uh, external technologies, we will not be able also to build our capacity. So these uh, developments are now, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, geographical indications. They are talking about the yams we have in Ghana. Okay. They are talking about the zoni we have in the Volta region. They are talking about the Olga basket. They are talking about the shea butter. They are talking about the cocoa from Ghana. They are talking about the kente from Ghana, edinkra, and then the but um the the the, the fugu was the the one from the north. Um, uh, Batakali. Batakali. Thank you very much. And so all <laughs> these things are being done. And then I think those of you who are in the tech space, you should also begin to uh, leverage on that. I don't want to go into policies and laws that are in mm, Ghana mm, and mm. facilitating all that, but we should just continue to engage one another on this conversation. And I'm mm. sure as we keep engaging ourselves, we'll be able to uh, utilize intellectual property in our business strategies. And then maybe we may not see the fruits today, but as we move along, we begin to see the fruits just as China is beginning to see the fruits, South Korea is beginning, it has seen the fruits, and the Asian tigers are beginning to see the fruits. 
So we in mm. Africa and for that matter, Ghana, we should be able to start utilizing, utilizing IP, at least have the mm -hmm. conversation continuously. And then as we move along, we'll gain the necessary experience and expertise, and then we'll be able to also utilize IP uh, for our economic mm. business mm. development. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I think uh, at this point, I'm overwhelmed. It's information overload, but it's so crucial that we know these things. We have just five minutes left. I uh, have been notified. Um, maybe I want to make this appeal that we find another time to extend this conversation because it's so crucial. But I want to use the rest of the time to pick up the questions that are in the chat session because it really summarizes the rest of the questions we wanted to ask. Ni asked the question, and then we also asked another one, which I'll put together. So I'll, I'll throw that to you, um, Selom, since you registered and you talked about four years it took you. But typically, what is the process like in Ghana? And what the, how does it, what's the process like, and how much does it cost? How much does it cost um, to do this um, registration IP? I'll take your thoughts, Selom, and I'll come to um, Emmanuel. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Mr. Saki, uh, since he uh, has worked with Aripo and Waipo, would actually be a better resource for this, because yeah. it's it's really it's really um, um, it really depends on which consultants you take and which legal people you work with. We um, happen to have an alliance with some lawyers uh, based in 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 Houston, Texas, and so they did it with uh, uh, via uh, I think Waipo. It was for us. Uh, and that was the way in which we were able to do it. But then there were a lot of things that had to go into it. Um, and, and especially in the tech space, you have to be very, very clear and meticulous about what it is. Uh, and it mm -hmm. actually involves a lot of doing a lot of research. Because what, what mm -hmm. you normally send initially, the preamble is almost like a thesis abstract. Um, mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it's not a simple thing, especially for the international ones, but it is something mm -hmm. worth doing if you believe it has that much value. Great. At this point, I'll, I'll throw it back to you, Mr. Saki. Oh, yeah. Just, quickly, in, uh, in just a, minute, a minute. How long does it take usually? How much does it cost? And what's oh, yeah. the process thank, like? Yeah. Uh, th th thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, this is very quick. Um, uh, um, let's start it this way. You, you know, when you want to register an IP, you need to think about the number of things because you have the national, the regional, and the international. And then, as I mentioned, if you want to do national, that is Ghana, and then the patent laws, the industrial property laws, and all that, they stipulate the amounts which uh, are, are required to be uh, uh, for the registration. I, I personally don't think it costs that much. Maybe when you are, like uh, Salon mentioned, he went to the European Patent Office, uh, they are a bit expensive than the USPTO. It's also quite uh, expensive. I visited all those countries, so those uh, offices, and worked with them. Uh, but in in Ghana, the the cost I I think is not too much. I I don't want to. I think when we, I don't know whether it's on the registrar uh, registrar general's uh, 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 website or I do have the uh, uh, li which uh, you know specifies the various uh, costs. I also want to indicate that at Aripo, the cost is also there. Uh, you can go to the website and find the cost. But I did a whole calculation when I was at a repo. Uh, maybe if you have about 2000 maybe let's say, uh, the registration is about uh, $150. I'm just talking about it in dollar terms. And then um, you have the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the search and examination, which is sometimes uh, $450 or something. The grant and registration is about $600. And then, of course, uh, you have to maintain the IP over the years. And because of mm -hmm. this particular cost, I'm sure the Ghana ones are much, much lower in CD terms. Because of this, okay. cost, it's always important that before you start this endeavor, you just consult so that people can, uh, like people like us or the IP network or Kathleen or anybody who has knowledge on this, to be able to guide you to know the strategy you have to adopt before even venturing into registration. I, I always teach that thing so that we'll be able to mm. have value for money. And then beyond mm. that, you also have to assess the value of what you are holding. We have not mm. talked about that. Valuation of the IP itself or the mm -hmm. po economic potential of what you are holding. If we're able to assess it, I would want to add, say that 
the, the benefits you are going to get far outweighs the cost. If you go and ask mm. Pfizer the cost of registering the vaccine, COVID vaccine, and how much they have donated, the benefit has far outweighed the cost. But if you mm. don't calculate this thing very well, then obviously you get to a stage where you are incurring mm. a lot of costs, mm. but you are not getting the benefit out of it because you didn't assess the value of the IP you are holding very well before mm. you went ahead to register. Okay. 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 And I just wow. want to add to that that don't let the cost scare you because yeah. when you pay some of these um fees, they are valid for a long period of time. So for instance, with trademarks is value is valid for a period of 10 years and then you renew thereafter. Something like patents um mm. is valid for a period of 20 years. So even if you pay about maybe two hundred dollars or one hundred and ten dollars or whatever, you don't have to pay that fee till the next oh. twenty years for a patent. Mm. Oh, sorry, 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 uh, uh, Catherine. Uh, yeah. the, the patent system has maintenance uh, fees, which are yeah, it does have maintenance. But but you know, the, what what I'm saying is that for the application process. Oh yes, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank but you. But the understand. maintenance fees are higher than the application. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that is why it will be important for anybody who wants to take this step exactly. Um, exactly. For, for, to consult. And I think at the end, if it's okay, we would love to get uh, contact details to share so that people can follow up on these conversations. Because I'm sure on this call, we have a lot of entrepreneurs and innovators and people who would really now, hearing the $17 million richer example given by Salom, they might want to start heading towards the, the, the doors of the IP organization. And I think, Imano, you mentioned that for now, it sits with the Registrar General Department, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but, but can I just Great. make this promise? I think I will try and then uh, do this uh, cost elements for Ghana, for Aripo, for okay. the PC, which is international, maybe just mm -hmm. case studies, and then, then pass the, it on to you guys. So you can share it with okay. your colleagues, yes. Great, great, great. Thank you. And I think the last question, which was a first, was asked, and a, a bit of it was answered, but I, I took it from your angle, lawyer. Um, you, what happens if someone copies your IP and patents it before you do? So I have my idea, beautiful. And so this is the last but one question. Quickly, um, what do you do? C Caitlin, someone copied my, I have this idea. He copied, somebody copied it, um, it and patents it before I do, because he said first to file and you made a statement. You said first to first file, first to, and first to invent. Happens? Yes, what happens? Yes. Um. So it's it, that's why I said I I I um. I'm I made registration pronounced like it's a first to file and first to invent mm. process. So mm. you if if you claim that you um invented it first, you have to prove that because it goes through a checklist. Like I said, it has to be new. It has to be original. Mm. So you have to. Um, prove that I invented this first, I went through this product first, I went through this process first. So, like I said, okay. from the law perspective, it's a first to file, first to invent. Usually, that's why it's best to conduct a search. You conduct a search, it has this, is this process in, in motion? Is this product okay. existing? Okay, great, great. And our last question, thank you very much for that, um, Caitlin, and, um, it's really appreciated. So, Ni, you got your answer, please go and file before you tell somebody about your next idea. And lastly, um, Ni asked another question. He said, hey, you've figured out a new way to distribute e-documents via USSD. His solution is suitable for events like funerals, trade fairs, and conferences, and it requires the, that, that requires the distribution of brochures. Whilst I don't own the USSD technology system of the distribution, um, he, whilst he doesn't own the USSD technology, the system of the distribution is novel to him. Can he patent it? Mr. Saki, what do oh, you think? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I think, uh, again, um, so, uh, the, um, uh, again, uh, one of the things that I don't want, I, want, I don't want you to be doing quite often is mm. uh, ref referencing everything to patents. Uh, and I am very much mm. concerned about that. Let, let's try Please and educate us. The, the whole mm. IP space. Uh, IP space. Mm. And then look at it. The, 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 I didn't get the question very clearly, but I have a feeling that it will border on uh, business methods or something. So can I can I quickly summarize again? So he oh, says worry, that I, I, I understand. I understand what the person. It, it may border on business methods. It's something about 
uh, ability to, uh, you know, uh, distribute distribute um, case, documents yeah, via yeah. USSD. Yeah. Exactly, it may have something to do with the business methods. Uh, okay. Uh, apart from the fact that the 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 fixation of that distribution may be a subject of copyright, but the 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 mechanism of distributing is 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 something like a business method. Normally, in the in the in the space of business method, I didn't highlight it because in this part of the world we don't really really protect business methods, and so um, maybe United States and some other parts of the world they do. Uh, but this uh, Africa here, I don't know any country that has even is protecting business method, but we can look at the questions of uh, copyright and then the issue of the computer software programs in copyright to see if that avenue can be utilized once I get your question very clear, and then I'll be able to help this individual to be able to do that. But patenting, I don't think it is a functional uh, okay. Yeah, you know, kind of uh, okay. things which uh, then becomes a subject of invention. So, but the other so other new. Things... Sorry, sorry for cutting you, Imano. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so I was going to say, Ni, please, um, we'll try and see how we can get contact de share contact details, and then we can get f further into these conversations. Our time is up. Um, we're going to take a group picture, and whilst we turn our camera on, we want to just take a turn our cameras on for just a moment and take a group wow. picture. And whilst we turn it on, we want to have the last question from Elijah. He said, what, what if I file for an IP for an invention and while in the process, someone else starts another IP on the same thing, but ends up being the first to complete? Okay, so maybe two people have the same ideas at the same time. Once to go, one uh, applies for the IP first, but whilst it's still ongoing for the process to be completed, somebody else also, also a files, and the, the second person's uh, person gets the IP or whatever granted to him first. What does he do? Oh, well, that will not happen. Uh, we mm. have something we call first to file. Uh, mm -hmm. Once you file the application, we are, you are given a, a filing. A, what do we are call you filing date, and that filing date is very crucial. It's a date okay. on which every other thing. Uh, 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 proceeds from, and and mm. the twenty years that Kathleen mentioned is calculated mm. on the filing day. So if I file an application today, I become the the first to file. If you file it tomorrow, uh, and then you continue your process, uh, it will not end because my process has to end before yours. If mine mm. ends and it fails, yours will kick in. Mm, mm, Otherwise, mm. we are going to have a lot of problems because we, we it is first to file. So everything we we have something we call uh, prior art. Prior art is any knowledge that uh, is in existence before the date of filing. So if I file mine today, you file yours to do tomorrow. I have the priority over yours. So mm, every, okay, yours yours comes up mine. So everything then becomes uh, in relation to mine. So the issue will be that you probably might have copied mine. Mm, and okay. we handle okay. it like that until mine falls off. If it is found that mine is not inventive, and then maybe you have done some modification to whatever it is, and then that modification is novel. Maybe you'll be granted a pattern, but it, it will not happen that somebody has been given a filing date and another person goes somewhere to file another thing, and then he gets a pattern for it to know. It's a global mm -hmm. uh, 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 criteria of patentability. Novelty is okay. global. Okay. Mm, thank you. So file means file, not yes. granted. Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that clarification from you, Imano. And then and Caitlin also followed up and said um, there will also be a pending application. So thank you very much for all of these. Um, Elijah says interesting insights. And I think he just took the word out of my sale. This has been so educational and informative and boy i wish there was so much time but unfortunately our time is not our best ally today so we will see if there is any plea we can send in for a part two of this conversation because Selon brantier um Imano, Imanosaki, 
and our last resource person, Caitlin, both have given us a lot of information within the last hour, and we are so grateful to you. Please, let's turn on our camera and take a picture for this moment. We, we could just say we are one of the ambassadors of IP in Ghana. I, I will hope that following this conversation, there will be a lot more people who are going to file for IPs here um, in Ghana so that we wouldn't have that small statistic of people always um, who are filing for IP. Hey, my video is not turning on. Let me go to the other device and see. Okay, Chanessa, do we have our screen, uh, our, our shot already? Hi, Ibrahim, Samson, Winnie, Pearl. If you can, it's just a moment, please. Yeah. Okay, just a little roll call. Noble, Liz, Louisa. We just want to take a, a, a quick shot and then we will be out of here. Do we have our photo already? If you turn your camera on, we promise it will be just five seconds. <laughs> we won't keep it on for so long. But I'm sure some people might have also joined in from probably meetings and other places and they might not be able to turn it on. So Chanessa, do we, do we have our, our photo? Great. Thank you, thank you so much. And it's been an exciting all today. And like we said, we really thought that IP is an area that we should really focus on here in Ghana, especially as the potential it has and has been enumerated by our panelists already. It's economic and moral benefits that you could stand to gain. And me, for me, my takeaway was that $17 million richer gentleman. I wish you were my friend. Um, I think I'll see you, Salom, for you to do an introduction after here. But thank you so much, Salom, <laughs> um, for, for, for joining us today, sharing your insightful perspectives on today's discussion from your own experiences as a business development, um, professional policy analysis, marketing, public speech, branding, and identity, and a tall list of experiences that you have. Thank you also um, for joining us, Kaylin Botre being a lawyer yourself and having a lot of perspectives from the angle of the law, we say thank you for sharing your experience with us. It's been insightful and we say we are so grateful for sharing with us. And last but not least, our man who has, I refer to him as, has eaten, briefed, thought, talked, discussed, and done everything IP for the last many years that we know um, he's been doing this. We say thank you so much, Emmanuel Saki, for sharing your perspectives with us. We are so grateful and we look forward to another chance of taking this conversation to the next level. Please, please don't forget that this virtual panel discussion on IP commercialization has been made possible by the iSpace Foundation, by Risa Fund, and the UK Aid. My name is Kim David, and it's been exciting hosting you for today. Thank you, and we look forward to having another conversation with you in the future. Over to you, Shanessa. I think you can do it. Um, David, for being here. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, I just want to mention that please be on the lookout for these virtual sessions on our YouTube channel as they'll be uploaded there. So yeah, that's what I just wanted to mention. But then thank you all for making time to be on this call and then have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Thank you too. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Um, enjoy the rest of your day as well.